All right, so I guess we can get started. Welcome to this talk. It's going to be split in two parts. Uh, at first, we're going to uh, talk about some general security metadata formats. Uh, and in the second part, Stana will show some more practical uh, uses of this particular data. Um, so let's jump right in. Uh, when we talk about security scanning, we're ultimately trying to answer questions like, you know, is my product vulnerable to uh, this security issue? Is there a workaround or a mitigation for that security issue? Where can I find the fix? And if I apply it, how do I know that it actually worked on the system that I'm patching? Uh, and you know, what is the risk uh, to me if I don't patch my system? Um, so the building blocks of all these all these uh, questions is security metadata. And when we talk about security metadata, we have to start with the with the CVID, which is uh, which is at the center of most security metadata formats. Um, a CVID is a globally unique identifier of a security vulnerability. Um, it stands for common vulnerabilities and exposures. The, the project uh, is uh, operated by the MITRE Corporation, uh, which is funded by the US government. Uh, it now consists of 153 organizations from 25 different countries who are participating as CV numbering authorities. Red Hat is actually one of those CV numbering authorities, which gives it the uh, the power to assign CV IDs to security vulnerabilities. Um, and when we talk about CV IDs, that's just the actual ID part. Uh, but the CVEs themselves, of course, also represent the other security metadata around uh, the, the vulnerability. Here we can see a short graph of uh, how many CV IDs uh, have been allocated uh, since the beginning of the CV project in 1999. And that number is growing nicely and it's only going to go up, which doesn't necessarily mean that our software is getting more insecure. It's just that more uh, efforts are being put into security research, security reviews and audits, which are obviously discovering vulnerabilities. Um, so let's look at some examples of what CVEs look like uh, at different vendors. So here we can see a CV record uh, for the Palo Alto Networks from the Palo Alto Networks vendor for their uh, operating systems management interface. It shows some common uh, metadata that is usually associated with CVEs like the severity, the CVSS score, and how uh, particular uh, vulnerability affects a vendor's products. Next, we have a CV record from Ubuntu. Again, it looks fairly similar. It has some textual metadata. Uh, it again shows the, the severity of the issue itself and how that uh, vulnerability affects all of Ubuntu's uh, Linux systems. And finally, we have a CV page that Red Hat publishes, which uh, at the top of the page, we publish some uh, textual metadata, again, that allows users to come up to speed on what the vulnerability is about. Uh, and then lower at the page, we have a table of how that vulnerability affects all of the products that Red Hat ships. Um, so next up, we have the concept of security advisories, which is just a collection of software updates to security metadata and any relevant documentation. So uh, we're going from a singular vulnerability identified by CVID uh, to a collection of uh, updates that actually resolve those, uh, those CVEs. What you'd expect from a security advisory is information on which products and components are being updated uh, what CVEs are being addressed, uh, how are those CVEs fixed, whether you need to, you know, take any manual steps or you just run VM update like you do on RHEL or any, uh, or any RPM-based distro. Um, and what is the overall security impact uh, of the update itself? Uh, producing and consuming security advisories is fairly vendor specific, so it helps when you can uh, when you can represent them in some machine readable format. Because uh, you know, if you are consuming uh, security advisories from multiple vendors, it helps that they all use a common language. And for this, we have 
a standard called CVRF, which stands for Common Vulnerability Reporting Framework. Um, in its current version 1.2, it uses an XML schema. There is a new version coming out this year, 2.0, that uses a JSON schema, and they also renamed the standard to make it clear that it applies to representing security advisory content in machine readable format. Um, the common use cases for this is specifically if you are a vendor who is interested in this metadata, uh, it's a lot easier when you can consume it in, in a standard format across all of your technologies. So let's look at what this looks like in, in practice. Uh, here we have an example of two security advisories. On the left, you can see Google publishes security advisories for Chrome as uh, blog posts that contain all the interesting security metadata that you might be interested in, like the fixed version, the number of security fixes, their impact, and their CVIDs, but it's a blog post. So if you're interested in processing this information, you're left with you know scraping HTML and trying to parse it out. Uh, on the right, we have a hypothetical security advisory in the CSAF format, which uses the JSON schema for Django, which is obviously a lot nicer to process and read. Um, so let's look at a real example of what uh, how Red Hat publishes this information. Here we see a security advisory for the sudo package. This is the web view, which you can find on the customer portal. It lists all the necessary uh, textual metadata. Uh, and we'll, so let's look at what this looks like in the CVRF format, which we'll break down by uh, section by section. Um, the first part is some document metadata. This is data about the CVRF document itself. Here, the most important bit is probably the ID and the revision history. The document type um, can also vary depending on what kind of document, what kind of security content this is. Some vendors publish informational security bulletins. Uh, some vendors may publish notices of upcoming security advisories uh, that may note mitigations only instead of noting the fixes. Um, yeah. The next section is document notes, which is used mainly for documentation. Uh, it's pretty much up to the vendor what they what kind of information they provide in this section. Uh, Another important bit here is the aggregate severity at the bottom, which lists the the most impactful impact, the, the most uh, critical impact uh, of a vulnerability in, noted in this advisory. So if there's 10 vulnerabilities fixed in this advisory and nine of them are rated as low impact and one of them is critical, then the overall aggregate severity of that advisory is still critical. Next, we have document references, which is fairly self-explanatory. Again, this is up to the vendor to decide what kind of uh, references they want to provide in here. And the next uh, the next piece is the probably the most important one, which is defining the products that this advisory actually fixes. This may look a little bit confusing, but it's uh, not really uh, basically the the standard defines products as a combination of branches which uh, are linked together with relationships. Uh, so we here we have two branch definitions, uh, the first one being the product family, which can be nested through through different types and establishes the product as rel eight. And then we have a branch for the pseudo package itself and then a relationship that links them together with uh, textual representation as the pseudo package is a component of RHEL 8. Um, this also gets assigned a unique ID that's a combination of the, of the two branches before, but the ID itself is actually arbitrary. It could literally be a random string. It's only used later uh, in the next section when you link the ID to actual vulnerabilities, which we can see here. This is one vulnerability, of course, an advisory can have multiple of them. Um, and the important bit here is the association of that product ID to uh, the status of the vulnerability itself. So here we can see that the CV ID that identifies this particular vulnerability has been fixed in 
the product ID that we established uh, earlier in in the in the product definitions. Um, the product statuses themselves can also note uh, last known affected versions, uh, versions that are not affected, and uh, and a lot of different uh, permutations of how a vulnerability may affect a particular system. Uh, each vulnerability can also then specify a lot of uh, supporting metadata that you can see uh, lower in the in the screenshot. All right, so. Now that we have all this information um, around affected products, fixed components, uh, list of fixed vulnerabilities and their impact, you could potentially use it to scan your system against this information. However, this, this format, this, the CVR format only gets you the information but doesn't necessarily tell you how to apply it to actual scanning of your system. Uh, if you were to create some sort of a scanner based on CVR, if you'd run into potential problems in uh, figuring out how to apply that data to, for example, the kernel package where a, a security advisory may note a fixed version of the kernel, but you would have to remember to check that that kernel is not only installed on your system, but is actually running uh, to be able to tell whether your uh, system is vulnerable. And that brings us to the second part of this talk where we're going to look at a purpose-built language that you know, solves some of these af aforementioned problems. So it's time to take it away. So I hope everybody can hear me. I never muted my microphone. Um, um, so what is OVAL um, and, and why, why does it exist? As Martin noted, CVRF, CSEV is maybe not the perfect solution if you want to scan uh, or verify uh, whether fixes have been applied to your system. Um, however, OVAL is a language that is designed specifically to tell um, you whether your fixes, uh, advisors that you have applied, or perhaps vulnerabilities that haven't been fixed in your products um, are or are not affecting your installations, your environments. Um, OVAL also covers a lot additional features that I'm not gonna cover, um, but the base specification um, for the OVAL language is about 140 pages, so it's not exactly light. Um, plus then there's extensions for various vendors Linux, Unix, like OSs, Windows, even iOS and Android, which allow uh, vendors to add custom checks uh, that are relevant for their platforms or their products. Um, we'll see why that's important in a little bit later. Um, so the old definitions then, once you have them produced, once you have those documents, uh, can be read by various tools. Um, we'll see in a little bit OpenSCAP, which is available freely in RHEL, Fedora, et cetera. Um, um, there is, for example, Claire, which is part of Quay.io, um, which is a scanner behind a container held index that also uses Oval. Um, and there's many other scanning vendors that actually can use OVAL as well, uh, whether a container or not. Um, and th why this is important is that vendors themselves uh, produce these OVAL documents. Um, and then customers who might have mixed environments with multiple platforms, so they might have a mixture of a Linux and Windows and maybe Android devices that they manage, um, they can then uh, use oval definitions from all of these vendors with a single scanning vendor uh, can then scan uh, their whole environment and maybe give them a better compliance overview across um, mixed sorry mixed environments. Um, now, um, one important thing to note here is the data itself for how to test whether a product is or isn't vulnerable, whether specific vulnerability applies. Uh, it's up to the vendors themselves. So Red Hat ideally produces oval data for itself or for its own products. Uh, Debian will produce its own oval metadata. And this poses a, a, a question or, or a concern that is quite often repeated, which is that how do I know that my vendor is not faking the oval data to make himself look better? Um, and it's a good question and customers should hold their vendors accountable for providing 
correct and complete overall metadata. But who better to know how to verify their products than people who actually develop them and ship them? Um, excuse me. So to give you a better idea of how things look, I'm going to do a very quick demo um, in, um, in a RHEL 7 container that I've prepared in advance just to make this faster. So I, I have a very minimal RHEL 7 container where I installed OpenSCAP and I've downloaded um, some oval definitions for RHEL 7, including unpatched CVEs, um, which is going to be important in a little bit once I show the report. So I'm going to run this OpenSCAP report. Uh, using these definitions that I've pre-downloaded, and I'm going to generate an HTML report, which I'm going to show in a little bit. I'm going to run this. This is going to take about a, <clears throat> about a minute and a half. Um, while we're waiting for this, I'm going to show you a little bit uh, where the oval definitions, for example, can be downloaded, how they look. Um, so uh, Red Hat publishes uh, our own oval metadata and WW Red Hat Security. <clears throat> I apologize, my voice is giving out um, uh, data of all v2. And um, this structure then um, starts with top level um, main product lines and then many, many additional files, one per product version usually um, that provides information or oval definitions for a given product. Um, this is Debian's oval <clears throat> repository definition, um, which again has one file per um, major Debian version. And this is uh, SUSE's, apologies, SUSE's um, oval uh, repository. Um, as you can see, the enterprise vendors repositories are a little bit more complex. And the reason generally is that they have uh, multiple support streams or supported versions um, that might be even combined or layered on top of each other. And so it becomes a little bit more complicated to provide accurate oval data. Um, um, now, I'm not sure if the, so the report hasn't finished yet. It takes about a minute and a half, but I'm not going to wait. I'm just going to show you what I've already generated uh, before with the same command. Um, this is OpenSCAP specific report. Um, different tools would produce different reports, obviously, or different view of these results. Um, different tools, uh, for example, satellite or, or other scanners that specialize in this might provide better overview over like large infrastructures, uh, maybe generic reports across. But for what we want to show, this should be enough. Um, so I'm going to jump just to the results. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Um, and so for each um, result, um, each line uh, the, is basically a test that was run against the scanned environment. In these cases, we see that we have an ID uh, which will need to be unique, which we'll see in a little bit. It's a unique ID within the oval definition file. Um, it's again, can be basically anything, but it needs to be unique within the file. Um, we see the result of the check, whether it's true or false. True usually means that something's wrong, something failed. Uh, we have a class of the test that was run. Um, at least for Red Hat metadata, that means we either have class patch or class vulnerability. Class patch is for checks which um, are referencing advisories that have been shipped. Um, so um, as Martin was showing earlier, this references um, the security advisories and CVE metadata um, in the links uh, that are shown here, which I'm not going to show right now, go um, to vendor specific pages, perhaps in our case. Um, in this case, we know that the container image that I was showing and scanning um, contains two um, missing security advisories. So we could have applied them, but we don't have them applied right now. So we should probably run yum update within the container or rebuild the container with the latest security fixes. Um, 
But in addition, um, the definition, since I'm using the RHEL 7, including unpatched uh, Red Hat definitions, they also contain vulnerability class definitions. These are definitions that Red Hat hasn't fixed yet uh, for one reason or another. Usually, uh, it's either the vulnerability is very new, and so there hasn't been time to release a fix, or uh, vulnerability is low, medium, um, and the impact has been decided is not sufficient to actually backport a fix. Um, but Red Hat still provides this information for customers if they want to reevaluate, uh, perhaps. Maybe they need to uh, bring it up with support and say, okay, this CV is still present. Uh, it really is important for us. We really want you to fix it. Um, so this is the report. Um, now, uh, I'm going to go and show a little bit what the document itself looks like, the oval definition, the oval building blocks. Um, so it starts uh, with an, it's, it's an XML file, so it starts with an XML definition, uh, which has a class ID and a version. Uh, class, I've already explained, patch versus vulnerability, but there is multiple additional classes um, that I'm not going to talk about, but you can look them up if you'd like. Um, there's the ID, again, the very unique identifier of the test itself within the oval document. And then the version, which is not as important, but it's versioning um, scheme for vendors to uh, say if something changed in the document itself. Um, the second building block is the oval metadata. Uh, this is relatively free form and it's not specified too much in the oval language, uh, perhaps with the exception of the affected node <clears throat> and references. Um, as I mentioned earlier, these references that you can see here, that are highlighted in red, that's what gets shown in the OpenSCAP report and that might be shown in various other integration integrations when you have oval scanners. Um, so this is part of the spec. However, everything else that you see here is not part of the spec, and it's, in this case, Red Hat extension, shall we say. Um, and I'll highlight one particular part, which is the affected CPU list. This is going to be a little bit important later uh, when we're trying to decide which oval files or which oval definitions uh, our scanners should use. Um, okay, so the next and the most important part of the oval document or oval definition is the criteria. Criteria is a block of rules uh, that can be logically combined um, and define an actual check um, whether a scanner, scanning scanned environment has a missing patch or is otherwise vulnerable. Um, I will note here that though the comments here are human readable and nice, uh, they are just comments and the oval scanners at least should not uh, use them. Um, instead, they will follow uh, these test ref IDs, which again are unique within the document, but otherwise have no um, specific meaning and are up to vendors to define. So let's follow one of these. Um, for example, the cloud init is earlier than and the test ref is this string here. Um, so if we follow it in the oval document, we'll find that there is an RPM info test with the same ID as was referenced with the test ref. And within it, um, if we follow the breadcrumbs, there's two nodes, uh, XML nodes, referencing an object and a state. And again, we have two references to some further objects within the oval document. So following the breadcrumbs again, um, we find these two definitions, the RPM info object with the matching ID, uh, which defines that the name of the RPM info object should be cloud in it. And this RPM info state, uh, which defines that the EVR string, meaning the epoch version and release, uh, should be less than 0.18.5. And if these this criterion is true, that means that the test or check has failed. Um, so we can see here, this is how we can combine uh, with the logical uh, combinations. There's not just the less than, uh, but there's higher than. So you could have uh, even, um, uh, for example, version spans to check. Uh, now, um, there are many more, uh, many more oval tests or oval types of checks um, in Linux, especially. 
So there's the RPM info, which I've already mentioned. There's the RPM verify file, which can check um, state of the files on the file system versus uh, database, uh, the RPM database. Uh, it can check status of as Linux Boolean variables, um, of Selenix contexts on specific paths. It can check systemd unit properties, whether they're enabled, disabled, what variables, what state they're in. Uh, there's uname, there's text file content, uh, which can do uh, regular expression matching in plain text files. And many more checks. There are checks that are missing. And while I'm doing the next demo, I would like you to think what, what you see that you would say is missing. And if you can then maybe put it in a chat um, and we'll see. So this was the previous test that was done. I'm gonna run the second one. Um, so the previous test I ran within the container itself that already had the OpenSCAD installed, uh, which could also be a virtual machine or somewhere else. However, obviously that requires that in all of your environments you have OpenSCAD scanner installed, which is perhaps not ideal. However, um, OpenSCAD provides uh, a way or a wrap, simple wrapping script that can do offline scanning of uh, container images, uh, virtual machine images, and uh, I believe some other um, content types. Um, so in this case, I'm gonna do Podman on share um, to allow Podman to mount the volume uh, that I'm gonna use. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna run the OpenSCAD-Podman command, which is, um, included with the OpenSCAP package. And I'm gonna run it on the image that I've prepared without the OpenSCAP installed in it. Um, otherwise, it's a very similar image. And I'm gonna use uh, different definitions. I'm gonna use RHEL 7 extras, including unpatched. Extras are additional plugins for RHEL 7. And I'm gonna run it against this image. In this case, the um, check is very quick. Uh, because uh, the amount of definitions in extras is much lower. So let's look at the results. Let's see how they look. Um, so this is the extras report. And we see here um, that there is an additional vulnerability that didn't show up uh, previously uh, in the original report. And that's the lib SSH vulnerability that is not fixed. Now, the question is, why didn't it show up before? Um, and the reason uh, for this is uh, because we use the RHEL 7 definition, but not the RHEL 7 including extras. Um, and this shows one of the problems with OVAL, and that is picking the correct OVAL files, uh, which right now, at least for Red Hat, can be a little complicated. Um, so let's see what you could do to pick the correct OVAL file. If we're talking about container images, um, Red Hat built container images uh, that are presented in the container catalog have within them um, a set of files within the root build info content manifest directory, um, which contain um, content sets. Uh, content sets are basically a repository name, um, which can then be locked at a complementary uh, metadata um, called repository to CPE. Um, if you look it up, um, you'll, you'll be able to find the matching CPE for a given repo. Um, and if you remember, I was showing affected CPE list metadata piece within the oval. Um, those can be then matched to pick the right oval definition to use or oval definitions. Outside of containers, um, uh, it's a little bit different because we don't have, or we don't have an obvious place to put the content manifest, but you can use um, contents of the Red Hat repo, or you can basically run which repos are enabled uh, using yum. And the repo names, again, are the same as the repository to CPE. Uh, there are some exceptions with regards to EUS, a long-term uh, support stream, which gets complicated. But even, even with this, even assuming everything works, we can see that this is not really um, user-friendly, is it? Um, there are other limitations and problems. I, after I'm done and I'll look at chat, I wonder if anyone figured it out um, before. Um, all of the tests that I was showing, um, or the test types, kind of rely on fixed paths. 
Um, so um, the, the types of tests are defined within the language or one of the extensions, uh, but that means that custom installation paths are not easily supported. So if you have a zip or, um, or some other non-standard, non-RPM way to install your product, uh, writing an oval test for it might not be easy because you don't know where the customer will unpack the zip and you don't have a way to, to scan the scanned environment fully to like find out where it is. In a similar way, there is no support for language specific package managers. So you cannot ask, um, okay, give me all the Python paths or is there any library with this name installed in the Python environment with a given version? Um, which is obviously a little unfortunate. Um, and an additional problem, obviously, as we've kind of seen in the previous slide, the complexity of oval files or their amount um, and the need to use perhaps multiple oval files to scan a single system uh, um, makes it really tricky to, to consume and generate these oval files. Um, this is especially true for vendors which uh, have multiple products that reuse and remix each other and perhaps have same package names but different versions uh, where they maybe backboard different fixes um, or the same fix is going to end up in different versions. Um, and so what could ideally be a one oval file for all of like all of the Red Hat products it cannot really be done that way because A, the oval file would be humongous and um, writing those tests would be very error prone. It would be very easy to trigger the wrong check on the wrong product. So what's next? What's, what's, what can we do to improve the situation? Um, I strongly believe that avoiding standards is not a solution. Um, maybe oval is not gonna be the the one and only, and maybe we'll need to rethink. Uh, but for now, um, I do believe that maybe we can just extend the oval spec to provide better tests or better flexibility that scanners can then use um, to scan the environment. Um, one of the missing tests that I kind of alluded to is that we, we can scan container content as I was showing. Uh, but we cannot scan the container itself. So we cannot ask, uh, let's say you're scanning a virtual machine. There is no oval test that can say, is there a container image with this digest running? Or even better test would be, is there um, a container image um, from this repo and this version running um, or any previous version or any image that is built on one of those previous versions? So these tests we cannot currently write um, because the oval language doesn't support it. Um, and obviously we would need to do a similar version comparison as we do for RPM versions, something like it to be able to compare. Um, we should also have a way to fi simplify finding correct oval files and especially outside the containers and maybe find a way to support custom package managers, custom installation paths. Um, that's it. Uh, we have some references in the back and I'm very much interested if there were questions or other things. Um, I'm going to unshare my screen. So we have a question in the chat, so I'm going to read it out loud because the chat isn't recorded. So Stanislav, this is a really good feedback for the OpenSCAD team who are involved in the Oval standard. Have you had a chance to talk to them about these limitations? <laughs> Not yet. Um, we, uh, I started working on Oval um, I don't know, half a year ago, maybe actually less than half a year ago um, after one of our team members left and I picked up some things. Um, and um, one of the things that has been on the back burner for us is uh, providing better tests for containers. Um, and right now, uh, there really isn't a, an obvious way how to solve this. Um, uh, there is a class of containers called container first, if, if you're aware, which is basically containers that contain non-RPMs, right? Um, 
it they contain maybe Golang um, static binaries um, that even if we know we're vulner they're vulnerable, um, and we know that the container image was released in an RHSA in a security advisory, we have no real way to to write that oval test that will scan your environments and see if you have perhaps that image somewhere. Um, however, for container images, there are specialized tools um, uh, that that do this scanning. So maybe maybe the answer really is that we we, we don't bother an oval and maybe um, supply something specific for containers, some metadata that can be used um, for this. Um, it, it is, for example, it is possible that the CVRF metadata for scanning containers, like container first images, might actually be enough. Like that information that we already produced might be used. And, and maybe we don't try to extend the oval language itself. 